Uh, thank you. Uh, the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 10407, the name of Stuart Stevenson, on electronic and internet voting. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put in. I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons down. I call on Stuart Stevenson to open the debate. Mr Stevenson, I see you. Uh, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and let me start by drawing attention to my register of interests, in particular my membership of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the IET, which is promoting e-voting, and to my membership of the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM, which is leading debate on the subject in the USA in particular. Professor uh, of Computer Science at Stanford University, David Dill, who is the founder of the Verified Voting Foundation, captures the challenge of electronic voting, indeed any form of voting, when he wrote, the winners of an election are usually satisfied with the outcome, but it is often more challenging to persuade the losers and their supporters that they lost. To that end, it is not sufficient that election results be accurate. The public must also know that the results are accurate, which can only be achieved if conduct of the election is sufficiently transparent that candidates, the press, the general public can satisfy themselves that no errors or cheating have occurred. Until 1872, voting here was by attending the polling place, orally advising the returning officer for whom one wished to vote and seeing them record that against your name in a ledger. Now, many of these ledgers survive today. Uh, is that a perfect system that met uh, Professor Dill's challenge? No. The ledgers often show that at the end of voting, uh, there was debate as to what an individual elector had actually said or whether the clerk had correctly recorded his, and in those days, it was always his preference. The change to the use of voting papers in a ballot box was solely because changes in the franchise qualification led to a dramatic rise in electors and oral voting was too cumbersome. We have today a system that works pretty well, that those who vote have confidence in, that broadly allows losers in particular to observe the process and be reconciled to the fact that their loss derives from their having, their having failed to win the argument rather than from the voting system having cheated them. The open rights group say that any voting system must be secure, anonymous, and verifiable. Technologists accept these tests, with Professor Dill uh, quoting the ACM, voting systems should enable each voter to inspect a physical record to verify that his or her vote has been accurately cast and to serve as an independent check on the result. Professor uh, Kali Yarmurthy, head of the Department of Information Technology at India's Bharatha University in Chennai, writes, internet voting is about making the act of voting as convenient as possible, while qualifying that by saying, this voting channel introduces risks to some of the fundamental principles of democratic systems. The question that I would pose is, is more convenient voting of value? Would greater convenience enhance uh, the democratic process? Now, I've heard uh, some people say, uh, some say that people who didn't make the effort to get out of their armchairs to vote don't deserve the vote. Now, I take a very different view uh, from that that some have expressed. And every political party and independent candidate, for that matter, devotes an enormous amount of effort to getting people out of their armchair and into the polling place. But there are three numbers that should challenge us. 53, 44, and 34. 53 of percent of those in an electoral role voted armchair in the 2017 council elections. 40% in this parliament's last elections, and a third stayed away from the 2017 Westminster vote. So noting the IET's call for government to embrace the latest in electronic voting, can technology help boost turnout securely with voter anonymity and verifiably by lay observers? So what actually helps turnout? When I stood in 2003 
uh, our local uh, voter database had 6,000 people who in the last two contacts with our party had committed to vote uh, for the SNP, but who had actually failed to vote in the two most recent elections. So we concluded that we need to get those people to vote. We spent a considerable amount of time, huge number of activists, knocking the doors of these 6,000 people. And we got 4,000 of them to sign up uh, for a postal vote. Now, typically, about 70% of postal voters do vote. I think that it's fair to say there is imprecision and some uncertainty uh, about that vote. You can only infer by looking at those who voted in person concluding how many votes there therefore were that were postal indirectly uh, by knowing how many postal votes uh, were issued. But it's clearly higher for postal voters. And in the example that I cite from 2003, in an election when across Scotland uh, the SNP's vote was heading downwards, pretty sharply downwards it's worth saying, our local vote went up by 3,000. Now you may care to think about that, we signed up 4,000 postal voters. I assert 70% of postal voters vote. So therefore, I can draw a line between the effort we made to get 4,000 people signed up for postal vote and an increase in our vote of 3,000. Given that people had 21 days over which they could vote from their armchair, uh, may have been one of the reasons uh, why our vote shot up. Now, of course, it was the excellent candidate and the terrific campaign uh, that was running Bam and Buchan uh, that made its own contribution to the result. But I think process as well make it even easier to vote. Have countries that have adopted internet voting seen benefits? And do their systems meet the tests of security, anonymity, and verifiability? There's pretty mixed results but there is some substantial evidence of increased voting. Uh, University of Eindhoven researchers De Vries and Boxlag assessed the Estonian system and the Dutch internet voting system using eight criteria, which essentially encompass uh, the three I've already referred to. Estonia generally regarded as the most advanced online country uh, after the cyber attack from uh, the, the Russians uh, shortly after they became independent. Uh, did not meet the open right group's three tests. It only met two of them and passed only half of the Eindhoven researchers' criteria. The Dutch system met only one of the researchers' eight tests and that very marginally. The key difficulty in any electronically aided uh, voting system is verification. Allowing the observation of every step in the process from voter registration through voting counting votes to the final result determination. Is this an unsolvable problem? No, but it probably at present is a problem not yet solved. Now, in my remaining 100 words, I cannot describe my solution, uh, which leaves paper as the medium for each vo voter's vote submitted for counting, but allows submission securely from smartphone to counting center and able to be verified by voter and observers. Uh, submission to the government's consultation closes on Monday. I'm sure the minister will make some reference to that. Uh, you will be able to read my submission uh, to elections team at gov.scot uh, when I publish it on Monday on my website at ivoting.stuartstevenson.scot. I hope you'll all make your contribution as well. There are seven unsolvable maths problems, the millennium problems. Uh, solve one of these and you win a million dollars. The problem that we're faced here looks rather simpler than any of them. I am working on one of the millennium ones, the Queen's problem. I think I'm halfway there, but this problem by comparison is by no means an unsolvable problem. Presiding officer. Thank you. And uh, just to advise you that you benefited from a fault in the electronic clock going on, you got an extra two minutes. It didn't seem to notice, but never mind. We're back to the right timings now. I call Jamie Halker-Johnson to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Halker-Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm tempted to start with uh, referring back to the uh, problems of voting systems and electronics, but uh, um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I congratulate Stuart Stevenson on bringing forward this debate. Uh, it's an issue that clearly has significant implications for our electoral system. 
Uh, in a democracy, our voting methods are important, and today's motion refers back to the Ballot Act of 1872, which met calls um, after the Second Reform Act to ensure a secret ballot. Many of the principles remain the same today, that we have a thorough system that is anonymous, secure, and guards against electoral fraud. Some of the issues around these principles have arisen in relation to postal voting, where we now have a system that essentially provides postal votes on demand. There have been undoubtedly some problems, and they are thankful, but they are thankfully small scale. However, however, personation, the offense of voting as another person, has gradually reappeared, having all but died off in the 19th century. In my own region, a number of the remoter island communities already oper operate universal postal voting. This enables election results to be delivered in good time, despite the challenges of geography. It is possible to see some potential benefits um, of electro uh, electronic voting in these circumstances if a robust system could be found. And we needn't think of this so simply in terms of people using computers in their homes or voting through mobile phones. Positive outcomes could be achieved without compromising security by electronic voting through new, more remote polling stations where activities could, be continue, could continue to be monitored. A number of the concerns that have been raised uh, with me relate to the confirmation of identity, but also the additional opportunities for undue influence that electronic voting may bring. These are not so much techno technological challenges as social ones. The idea of people together in a group environment on mobile phones receiving pressure to vote on the spot and subject to an influence of a crowd. Problems of this nature raise complicated questions. What, for example, if a person wishes to change their vote? Should this be enabled? Should there be a last vote count system in place? Will that impact on political campaigning or does it have a psychological impact on how people will, will in the end vote? This is a serious subject. Uh, serious subject, and, I would of course, and would of course merit further debate going forward. One of the concerns I do have with Stuart Stevenson's motion, however, is the suggestion that a switchover could help reduce costs. I appreciate that there's an inclination in motions to list potential positives, but I do not think that we'll be considering electronic voting as democracy on the cheap. As I've outlined, there are possibilities around these proposals, but some may in fact cost as much, if not more, to administer correctly. If voter flexibility can be provided, it may be worth paying a little more, but I would not wish to see any attempt to change the voting system where cost saving is put front of center. Front of center. Our, uh, our existing system is not perfect, but we should take time to consider the impact of changing long-held traditions. The Times columnist and former MP Matthew Paris once described our village halls, schools, um, and other polling places as small cathedrals of democracy. And I may be uh, a bit of an electoral geek and uh, a political geek on this, but I still get a buzz every time I go into a polling station because voting on some level combines binds society together. And there's perhaps a physical element too. If you look at those places where voting has been denied over a long period, you'll find people will queue for many hours sometimes actually just to have the chance to vote, sometimes in dangerous conditions. Those queues are a physical embodiment of democracy being practiced. And while we don't have queues necessarily in this country, in most elections, we lose that, uh, physical, um, that physical embodiment of democracy if we make voting as simple as that, voting for X Factor, Celeb, or some other, maybe even Bake Off. Um, and I'd also question whether making vote easier will actually mean more people will vote. I've always been surprised by the number of uh, older people even uh, who don't vote and have never voted. And even young people who I've spoken with about why they may not vote have said it's not a question of ease, it's a question of engagement. And that goes wider than just young people as well. So, much as, so as much as the technical hurdles must be considered, um, I would invite members to also give some of the other hurdles as well. Um, we should not be under any illusions that the potentially enormous changes electronic voting would create to our voting system. And if we, we, if we wish to make changes to how we vote, we must ensure that we get them right. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I apologise at the beginning to you that I will be unable to stay for the whole debate because I have a constituency engagement in Fife. Um, President Officer, I would congratulate Stuart Stevenson for securing this debate in Parliament today and I would want to support the principle that anything we can do to encourage people to vote and make it easier for them to do so is, in my view, a good thing. I come from a local government background and it can be very disappointing when you know how important local government is to everyday life to have some of the lowest turnouts for council elections. And that is why the subject is one that is often discussed in council chambers up and down Scotland. 
I would want to be honest and say I do not see electronic and internet voting as the panacea to addressing low turnout, but I certainly think it is worth further consideration along with other methods of good practice that can be picked up from many other countries. Earlier this week, I got an email from a constituent who was very concerned about electronic voting, and I did reply to him saying that I had an open mind. He was very worried about the security of such systems and the ability for the election to be rigged. Very real concerns, it seems to me. I noted that in Estonia, which has been one of the most successful countries in the use of e-voting, they say that a crucial part of that system is the online voting is linked to the country's state-of-the-art electronic identity cards carried by every citizen and every resident. Now, we know from experience that identity cards were not popular when they were muted for introduction in the UK. So it would be very important to know what introducing a successful electronic voting system would require and what the impact of that would be on the general public. The point, the point about identity cards was also made by the Professor of Security at the University of Surrey, Professor Stephen Schneider, who says the success of Estonia's system lies in the fact it was built from the ground up supported by a solid infrastructure, including the digital identification system. Given our track record with IT projects in this country, that would also be a major concern. I note that in the Netherlands, they did use electronic voting, but have returned to paper voting. And in Norway, where they tested i-voting, they decided to discontinue uh, that system. France also have said that they have concerns with cyber security. So if you're enthusiastic about electronic voting, I would have to say there are major concerns and obstacles that are very legitimate, and is why I do not think we will be moving in this direction anytime soon. We are seeing many concerns being raised about technology and how technology can be used to distort democratic processes. And until many of these issues and concerns can be addressed, then this is not the way I would want to go. In conclusion, what I would say is that last Thursday in the Clarkmanon by-election, I'm sure many of the candidates and others there would have been happy to have electronic voting, given that the voting took place through a red warning for the whole day. That said, you might just say common sense should be applied. Thank you. Thank you. I call Tom Arthur, be followed by Patrick Harvey. Mr uh, Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague Stuart Stevenson for bringing this issue to um, the Chamber. Uh, much of what I was going to say was already um, thoroughly covered by Stuart in the way in which he tends to cover every possible aspect of a debate <laughs> in a speech. And, uh, but I'm going to you know, um, utilise that piece of advice he gave me that in a debate, the debate isn't over um, when everything is said, but only once everybody has said it. Um, but I would like to sort of reprimand him on um, his divulging postal vote strategy. It's not something I think we should be necessarily sharing with opposition parties. Um, so perhaps if the official report would like to excise that from the record, I'd be most grateful. I, I must admit, I, I come uh, to this debate uh, certainly with, with an open mind as regards to uh, electronic voting, obviously. That is an umbrella term that captures e-voting and online voting, internet voting um, and electronic counting. I, I think there's very strong arguments uh, both for um, and against. Um, and I'm grateful for the uh, submission and um, open rights they've made available um, on their uh, website, the submission. I think they're the ones that we have made to the Scottish Government. And I think obviously we raise a lot of issues, some of which have already been touched on. Um, in, in terms of where I think e-voting can be, be positive, um, certainly online voting, that would be um, is the ease and accessibility um, with which it would allow people to engage with the um, democratic process. Certainly, uh, my own party, in terms of candidate selection, uses electronic voting, and that's a very effective way of doing it. It also allows people to, when presented with um, uh, options to vote, they can easily um, see that adjacent to uh, information on the candidate, or and indeed if it was to be for national elections for political parties, 
So sometimes uh, for people perhaps who um, only perhaps get engaged for thoroughly in politics at elections, they can go in and uh, some of the issues can be perhaps quite vague. Um, and obviously, we're not allowed to have campaign material within actual polling places. So there's opportunities there in allowing people to properly evaluate. Um, also, certainly, online electronic voting would facilitate other sort of voting um, methods, be it STV or, or such like, um, to be uh, you know, um, counted and um, verified um, far quicker. Um, but I also recognise many of the, the, the arguments against. Um, I think the key one for me is, is the challenge and difficulty in auditing um, clearly, electronic voting and the uh, various mechanisms of security that would be required create a, a level of opacity which only a, a technical expert with the, uh, uh, the capacities of someone like Stuart Stevens, Stevenson could you know, accurately discern. And I think fundamental for the democracy is the capability of any person without that expertise to be able to evaluate and, and discern. And there's nothing more straightforward than whether there's a, a cross of a number on a ballot paper. And I think that's important. Um, obviously, issues of personation, privacy, etc., um, are very relevant as well, and clearly concerns with potentially vote selling. Um, but these obviously are behavioural, and there's, there's aspects to that how that could be mitigated. Clear, clearly, a big concern in the present day and age is that, is that of foreign interference. Um, the kind of ongoing investigations in the United States are a testament to that, and that would. Uh, it's not just simply that experts could necessarily be convinced of the, uh, of, the, of the security and safety of these systems, but the general public has to be as well. There has to be, the confidence in the system has to be um, unimpeachable. Um, so I, I think for me that the balance I'd probably you know, where I probably stand at, at the moment is, is probably around e-counting, which I think um, is, a, is a very useful um, mechanism. It certainly works very well in, in local elections. I think the idea of trying to do an STV calculation by hand um, I don't think anyone would welcome that. Um, and I think certainly it's, it's something we could potentially look at for um, parliamentary elections to this place and, uh, and indeed to Westminster if that parliament um, so wish, uh, so wish to uh, consider. It certainly would expedite the process. Um, I think it would be very beneficial for the staff that have to sort of spend you know, long hours in, uh, in drafty halls. And I think certainly for all of us, it would be beneficial to all of us as candidates because it would shorten that period of having to wait and the uncertainty that goes with it. So just to conclude, I want to again want to thank Stuart Stevenson for bringing us a very interesting to, debate to the Parliament. Thank you very much. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm glad to have the, the chance to participate in this debate. And uh, can I apologise to Mr Halco Johnson for missing part of his speech. Uh, it's been a long afternoon in the chamber for me. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, can I just uh, emphasise that I, my party hasn't yet adopted any policy on the question uh, of online or internet or e-voting. Uh, and so I'm speaking from a personal capacity only. But I have to say that I would be very concerned uh, if we were to go down the route of a, of a trial of these systems. Uh, members are aware, because I've, uh, I've circulated uh, an email to this effect already, that I'm a member of the Open Rights Group. Uh, I was happy to host them uh, last week. Uh, sadly, that was on the, uh, the, the red weather warning day, and so not all members who wanted to be there uh, for the briefing event were able to. Uh, but I've uh, also circulated some of their uh, briefing material uh, to members by email. And just to run through some of those key concerns that the Open Rights Group set out. Uh, yes, this, this three-way test uh, of having a system that is secure, anonymous, and verifiable. There isn't much else that needs to meet this kind of test. People do ask, well, I do my banking online, I can file my tax return online. These things don't need to be anonymous. In fact, they require not to be anonymous. Other things might need to be anonymous, but don't need to be so secure. Uh, to achieve all three of these, uh, the Open Rights Group described this as an unsolvable problem, and they argue that in seeking to strengthen one or two of these factors in, in any system of, uh, of online or internet voting uh, would almost inevitably weaken the third. Now, I don't know whether uh, this is, in fact, a, a theoretically unsolvable problem. I'm not a, enough of a technical expert to know whether this is theoretically unsolvable. But I can see pretty clearly that the, that the more complex and the more highly theoretical the solution needs to be, 
the less comprehensible it is to most voters. A piece of paper with a mark on it, put into a metal or a plastic box with a, a physical secure tag on it, carried from one room in one building to another room in another building, opened in front of people's eyes, counted physically. Everyone can see, everyone has a tangible sense of the, the security, the verifiability, and the trust that there can be in that system. The more complex and the more theoretical and the more technological a solution is necessary to achieve that high standard of security, anonymity, and verifiability, the less trust a great many people will have in that system. And I also have to ask, what are we trying to fix by doing this? It's been asserted that this is a way of increasing turnout. And according to the, the research uh, that members have access to under the Open Rights Group's briefing. Analysis has been done of countries like Estonia, which has been conducting internet voting for, for a number of years, since 2007, in fact, a fairly substantial amount of data about how that system has worked. Uh, and they've uh, concluded that there isn't actually strong evidence of an increase in turnout. The uptake tends to be from people who were more likely to vote anyway. Now, I have to suggest that there are a whole host of other options that we should be exploring first if we're concerned, as we should be, about turnout. Reducing the voting age to, to 16 was a good step. Getting high-quality, creative, engaging citizenship education in our schools year after year, election after election, will help to drive up turnout. A whole host of other methods can increase turnout. This would be way down the list of priorities, even if there were not concerns around the security, the verifiability, and the anonymity of the process. And so I would urge the, the Scottish Government in looking at the responses to the consultation to pay attention to the response from the Open Rights Group and others who've raised these concerns. Uh, and I would suggest that we not proceed with a trial of internet or online or electronic voting at this stage. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Finlay Carson. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague Stuart Stevenson for bringing this important and exciting topic to the Chamber. As the motion points out, it's of course crucial that considerations relating to confidentiality and security are addressed. But for me personally, the potential of what e-voting could deliver makes it well worth exploring the topic and working towards this. And I welcome today's opportunity to contribute to the discussion. Presiding officer, I think we can all agree that democracy only works when people actually take part. And electronic voting holds huge potential for making it easier to vote, which could in turn increase turnout and engagement. And I think this might be particularly true for younger people who conduct so much of their lives online, but who also are least likely to turn out to vote. Figures from the Office of National Statistics for 2017 show that virtually all adults aged 16 to 34 years old, um, at 99% of them were internet users. At the same time, according to YouGov, just over half of 18 and 19 year olds turned out to vote at the 2017 general election, compared with 84% of those aged 70 and over. Um, now, that might have some appeal to some colleagues who, um, without wanting to be cheeky, and on my left there, um, they have a 50 point lead amongst the over 70s at the last election. So I would understand their <laughs> reticence at wanting to in increase um, the youth vote perhaps, but I think everyone in the chamber seriously would um, share um, the desire to see greater democratic engagement and turnout amongst young people. And in an era of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and Snapchat, hashtags and online petitions, imagine the impact on turnout if people could, for example, simply see a tweet reminding them to vote, click on the link and do just that, whatever the time of day or wherever they might be. Following the EU referendum in 2016, a YouGov survey found that of 18 to 24 year olds who failed to vote in the last election, almost half of those polled said they would have done so if they'd been able to vote online. Um, and though there is a particular case to be made for the impact of e-voting on young people, I think its appeal goes further. Um, as has been mentioned, Estonia has used e-voting since 2005, with more than 30% of voters casting their ballot online in the most recent parliamentary elections. 
The Deputy Head of Estonia's electoral office has stressed that e-voting has become massive and statistically there's no such thing as a typical e-voter. All voters, irrespective of gender, income, education, nationality and even computer skills, have the likelihood of becoming an e-voter. In a YouGov poll commissioned by... Yes, I will. John Halker jones I thank the member for taking the intervention. Wouldn't it be better if we actually got across to people, and particularly younger people, the importance of their vote, what it actually impacts on? Ruth McGuire. Absolutely, and, and I, I think that's something we can do right away, and I, th I think many of us in our political campaigning do do that, and it's not one thing or the other, and I, and I would certainly not suggest that e-voting is a solution to that, to that one problem. I think there's, there's lots of things that we need to do. The Welsh Government has recently announced its plans to pi pilot remote online voting in elections in Wales following the result of a recent consultation. Um, the submission from Web Roots Democracy notes that voters in the 2021 Welsh Assembly election will be the first generation of voters who won't recall a world before smartphones and social media. As time goes on, a digital democracy will become an expectation instead of an aspiration. And it's time we looked at how best we can bring this about and online voting will play an important part of that. The Scottish Government's own consultation on ele electronic voting is of course underway as we speak and there's a real opportunity here for reforming the way we vote in Scotland um, to make it more inclusive and engaging and to increase turnout amongst younger voters, perhaps to inject a new lease of life into our democracy. I'll just finish, presiding officer, by taking this opportunity to encourage any of my constituents with views on the matter to make their voice heard and respond to the consultation before 12th March. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call, before I call, <laughs> you're not in trouble, really you're not. Uh, due to the number of members, I've got four members who still wish to speak in this debate. I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. So can I invite Mr Stevenson to move a motion without notice? I so move. The question is, the de debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. I now call Finlay Carson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to thank Stuart Stevenson for bringing this debate to the Chamber this evening. As my party's spokesman on the digital economy, I'm pleased to be taking part to outline how many of the issues uh, are surrounding electronic voting. We are all now dealing with advancements in technology on a daily basis, and it's important to discuss this in the context of our democracy and elections going forward. While I believe there have been many constructive points raised by members tonight, I would like to outline why I still have many concerns over the introduction of electronic voting in Scotland and the UK elections. In December 2017, the UK Government commissioned Sir Ken Knight to look into electronic voting in industrial ballots. The warnings from Sir Ken's report are stark into how vulnerable the UK's IT systems are to cyber attacks. Only in April 2017, we saw the Foreign Office had come under a sustained attack from hackers alleged to be linked to a foreign state. And this led to the government reporting that they faced the threat of tens of thousands of cyber attacks every month. We are currently seeing very serious allegations that high ranking officials in the Russian government may even have helped put President Trump into the White House. Do we really want electronic voting to raise questions about the validity of who may be a resident in Butte House or who may be responsible for that uh, outcome? To point out an even greater warning about the dangers of electronic voting is to quote from Sir John Sayers, a former head of MI6 uh, in January 2017. And he said, the more things that go online, the more susceptible you are to cyber attacks. Bizarrely, the stubby pencil and piece of paper that you put your cross on and the, bullet bo the ballot box is actually much more secure than anything which is electronic. And I know from my past uh, uh, designing uh, cattle uh, management programs uh, for the computers, whatever, it's so much easier to uh, put in false records in a computer system than it used to be when you had to fill in the old uh, ledger by pencil and, and how it is almost impossible to delete records, whereas on an electronic basis, it, it's very straightforward. But as someone who very proudly visited um, a local polling station recently to vote with my 90-year-old father and 18-year-old son, I think we all need to learn lessons from what the former head of MI6 says. 
Now, Stuart Stevenson's motion refers to electronic voting increasing turnout, something which, of course, we'd all like to see. Uh, but and also at this point, I'd like to, to, to say that I'm not going to debate about the argument surrounding uh, lower cost elections because I, I don't believe you can really put a price on transparency and democracy. However, with regards to turnout, if we look at the evidence of countries across the world that it has not increased, uh, it resulted in increased turnout. In Estonia, which has used internet voting since 2007, it showed that it has done uh, very little to attract new voters. And in Norway, where trials were done in 10 principles in 2011, analysis indicated that younger voters actually preferred the walk to polling stations, identifying it as symbolic. Furthermore, 89% of those who voted via the internet would have voted anyway um, if the option hadn't been available. I'd also like to conclude by raising connectivity issues in my own constituency of Galloway and Western Fries. There are still widespread areas that are without good mobile or broadband signals, issues which continue to dominate my inbox. If we are wanting to encourage people to participate in our democratic process, should we not first ensure that everyone is able to participate electronically? As politicians, we all have a duty to encourage voters, young and old, to participate in our de democratic process. And we all know how much we've had to do that in the recent years in Scotland. However, as much as technology continues to advance, I believe that when it comes down to our democratic system, this is one area where I do not want to take away the pencil and introduce the click or the text message. We should heed the concerns outlined in Sir Ken Knight's recent report and look at better ways of increasing voter engagement and turnout. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to follow by Stuart McMillan and Stuart McMillan will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Harper. Thank you, presiding officer, and uh, thank you to my colleague Stuart Stevenson for securing this interesting debate. I know he's sitting behind me there. Um, it's only right that as a technology continues to develop at a fast pace, we examine how we could make the process of voting more in tune with the way people live their lives. And as the motion states, the traditional paper voting method has remained virtually unchanged since 1872. So I welcome the Scottish Government's consultation on the electoral reform, which seeks to further investigate the potential benefits of electronic and internet voting systems. Prior to tonight's debate, Stuart Stevenson circulated a, a helpful briefing note from the Institute of Engineering and Technology, or IET, which I read with interest. Some of the benefits highlighted within this paper I have read about before, for example, boosting voter turnout, cutting the cost of elections and improving accessibility. And many members have mentioned the IET as well, so I'm sure we found the, the briefing that Stuart Stevenson sent is very helpful. Under the current system, there is room for human error. Votes can be miscounted, misread or misplaced. When election counts go wrong, it can be very difficult to trace the problems back to their source. And there is no easy way to fix them other than simply beginning again. So what has been done so far to test electronic voting technology? In 2007, th 13 pilots were held during England's local elections. And in 2011, further trials were carried out in 10 of Norway's mun municipalities. As part of Norway's trials, two research centres carried out qualitative and quantitative methods to study participation and turnout. And the findings were perhaps unexpected. 89% of internet voters said they would have voted even in the absence of the online voting op option. This analysis was repeated in 2013 and the same conclusions were reached. So again, the trials did not have an effect on voter turn turnout. In fact, as Finlay Carson mentioned, younger voters tended to indicate they actually enjoyed attending the polling stations. As a result, the Norwegian government ceased the trials. And in England, after the 2007 pilots, the Electoral Commission voted, uh, voiced their concerns about planning and quality assurance and confirmed that these would need to be addressed before they lent support to further e-voting pilots. However, as members have already mentioned, in Estonia, they are a country that has used internet voting since 2007 and over a quarter of the votes cast are made online. The Estonians seem to have solved the problems of cyber security which the IET highlight as a concern by designing a system which lets voters sign and encrypt their own votes. The secret behind the solution is biometric ID cards. Every citizen has an online ID card which has a digital signing capability 
and the card can be used with a chip and pin machine to prove to the government agencies online that it is the user is the citizen of Estonia. However, I'm sure, as we all remember, the UK did have a debate about the introduction of ID cards last, in the last decade before the idea was shelved by the Tory Lib Dem coalition. So clearly there are legitimate concerns about the adoption of electronic voting and they need to be addressed before its widespread adoption. Not least, there are significant cyber security risks, which I have not had time to go into today. But I realise that uh, this may damage public trust in the voting systems. So fortunately, the IET have already started examining these issues in its policy and panel work and is engaging with the Electoral Commission to discuss these challenges. Until then, one way we can ensure increased public engagement with the whole electoral process is to continue to drive forward a vision for a better country and let people see for themselves that they have a government and a parliament that are committed to changing society for the better. Thank you. Call Stuart McMillan, please. So, uh, I too want to congratulate my colleague Stuart Stevenson for securing this uh, interesting debate. Uh, notionally, I am actually very sceptical uh, about the, the issue of electronic and internet voting. Uh, however, um, I think the motion that's actually before us was actually very detailed, it was also very measured, and I would suggest it's also very typical uh, of Stuart Stevenson. Now, Stuart Stevenson, uh, as we all know, is a, a mathematician. Uh, so I'm quite sure that uh, if uh, Mr. Stevenson actually had the time, he would be able to actually design uh, an electronic voting system uh, for Scotland to actually use. He's halfway there on one aspect he was talking about earlier, but I'm sure if he wasn't, wasn't in here, he could devote that time to design that particular system. Now, electronic voting uh, certainly does already happen uh, within the SNP when I mean, we have internal elections. Uh, and I, I think that's a system that actually does work uh, very well. But I accept that that's actually it's a small number of individuals within the wider electorate who will be taking part in that process. Now, I'm not sure about other parties if they have electronic voting or not internally. But uh, I, I, do, I do agree with the concept of electronic voting, but I do have similar concerns to colleagues regarding the issue of security, uh, amongst others. But uh, I want to kind of raise one point, and that was the, um, I actually had a cross-party group on visual impairment. Uh, not one member thus far in the debate has raised the issue of accessibility about voting. And uh, certainly at recent meetings of the cross-party group on visual impairment, uh, we've had the discussion about the, the consultation uh, that's in front of us in terms of the, that the Scottish Government have put forward. And members of the cross-party group who are blind and also visual impaired have raised issues about the problems of voting now with the system that we currently have. Uh, and many of them have actually suggested that if we did have an electronic voting system uh, using uh, tablets or phones uh, with the smart technology, then it would actually improve the accessibility for them to take part in the electoral process. Sure. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the, to the member for giving way. Uh, this issue was discussed at the Open Rights Group briefing last week, uh, and I think there was a general acknowledgement that we are all open to changes to the current voting system to improve accessibility, but there was also a concern that there is no single technological solution which would overcome all different forms of disability and the barriers uh, that exist to, to using technology. And we also know from research done by the Citizens Advice Scotland uh, that the barriers to using technology in other areas of life also correlate with issues uh, like social exclusion, like disability, uh, and, and a number of those other factors. So there's a danger that we would even compound an existing problem rather than solve it. Mr McMillan, and you will have extra time. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Officer. No, I thank uh, Patrick Harvey for that uh, contribution. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting for one minute uh, that the issue of electronic and internet voting is going to be a panacea. I'm not suggesting that at all. Uh, and not one person in the cross-party group has suggested that either. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a general concept, members of the cross-party group uh, were actually willing to, to examine uh, the possibility of electronic and internet voting as, a, as uh, by one means of actually increasing uh, accessibility and also increasing voter participation in the electoral system. Now, uh, certainly if, if electronic voting can actually help more electors get involved in the democratic process, then I think it is something that certainly should be examined. But I think also, I think we as politicians, we've got a crucial role to play in that as well, in terms of our campaigns, in terms of our party's campaigns, 
and in terms of how we actually engage with the electorate. But the motion uh, speaks about, the, and I quote, security considerations, confidentiality, eligibility, uh, that they must be resolved. And I absolutely agree. So before we do go into any type of wider electronic voting, these three points must be fully dealt with so that there is that absolute confidence within the electorate that their vote will be, will be counted, but also that the, the individuals will have that confidential vote. That's so, so important. Now, certainly, electronic systems have been used for many other things now in society. Electronic banking, I mean, billions of financial transactions certainly will take place on a daily basis. Uh, but, and I do believe that if we can actually produce electronic progress in these matters, then I'm sure that electronic voting should not be rejected as a concept. I think it's time will come, and I believe it's time will come. It's not there yet. Still got some way to go. I think some, some quite considerable way to go, and there is that work still to do. But uh, I think it's a, uh, to start the discussion and start having that dialogue, certainly within this parliament, I think is something very much worthwhile. And uh, once again, I do congratulate my colleague Stuart Stevenson for securing this debate. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to close the Government. Minister, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start by thanking and add my congratulations to the Member for securing this timely debate. In 2016, the Scottish Government gained additional powers over elections so that for the first time we have full responsibility for Scottish Parliament as well as local government elections. And we believe that this is the ideal time to consider the opportunities prevent, presented by new developments in voting technology. Particularly, we are keen to explore how recent electronic innovation might support our aim of maximising access to democratic participation. The Scottish Government aims to be a global leader in our adoption of digital solutions. Our digital strategy sets out how we plan to achieve this, and it includes a specific commitment to trial and electronic voting solutions. As Emma Harper and Finlay uh, Carson told us, many countries have, er have already um, either adopted or trialled um, some form of e-voting, and we too are open to exploring the range of options. This might mean trialling the use of electronic, electronic voting machines, which are already widely used in a large number of countries. It might also mean uh, researching the potential of internet voting, which is much, much less widely used for local and national elections and which does present significant security challenges um, as the terms of the motion highlights, but is, of course, as uh, I think Stuart McMillan said, already used for some significant elections uh, in this country. However we choose to proceed, taking into account the outcome of our current electoral reform consultation, this will not be Scotland's first foray into using technology to manage the electoral process. As Tom Arthur said, the electronic counting of votes uh, for our local government elections has been in place since 2007. E-counting has now been used successfully and I think without issue at the last two Scotland-wide local government elections as well as a number of by-elections. Indeed, only last May, almost 2 million votes were cast in local elections and counted across 32 local authorities in just eight hours. In all elections where e-counting has been used in Scotland, the results have been accepted by all those involved. However, some people may ask why we should consider moving away from the tried and tested paper and pencil based voting system which has uh, widespread public confidence. Well, 2018 is an important year in the history of our democracy. February the 6th marked the 100 years since the passing of the Representation of the People Act 1918, which allowed some women aged over 30 to finally vote in elections in the UK. So does it not seem a bit odd that in, in our most recent ele council elections um, last May, and indeed in all elections held in Scotland, votes were cast in much the same way as they have been since the 1800s. And it was great to hear from Stuart Stevenson what happened prior to 1872. So we're, we're, every, every day is um, a learning experience when Stuart's around. Um, but doesn't that seem extraordinary that the process that is so important to our um, act of citizenship and democracy hasn't materially changed for over 100 years? Yes. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't seem extraordinary to me that it hasn't changed. What it suggests to me is that we have a system that works, that is secure, that is anonymous, that is verifiable, that meets the tests which are not yet apparently meetable, may never be meetable 
uh, by a, an internet system. Can the Minister tell us, I'm sure that he will pay close attention to all of the consultation responses, including those raising these concerns, when would he expect the Scottish Government to come forward with a proposal uh, that I assume will come to Parliament before any decision is finally made? How long after the consultation closes does he anticipate bringing forward those, uh, uh, those recommendations or proposals? Minister. I thank the member for the, the question. Obviously, I'm going to come back to the consultation um, uh, later, but um, as, as with all consultations, the consultation will close. Um, we will then take time to analyse and, and bring that back. Yes, absolutely. Take, taking forward anything in terms of elections, we, we need to try and do that by consensus. I, I do, do recognise the, the tests that, that, um, that Mr Harvey raises. I would argue that when we look at the current system, that the three tests are not met 100% by the current system um, either. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we clearly need to, 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 um, to look at all the arguments and we will look, as, as um, I say, very carefully at all the representations that are made in the consultation, including the ones from the organisation Mr Harvey uh, mentioned. But technology has brought us to the point where we can shop with a watch, consume media on the phone and count two million votes in, 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 in eight hours. So, is it right that our um, elected representation remains basically unchanged since Victorian times? And that, that is something that we need to look at. Um, clearly, we made a decision in terms of moving to e-counting in local government largely based on um, need, driven by need in terms of the introduction of the STV uh, voting system. But I, the question I'd ask us to consider is what if instead of being led by need, we were led, driven by um, opportunity and clearly new technology brings potential benefits which I'm, and I'm going to try and highlight a couple which have already been covered by others. So firstly, Stuart McMillan said for many of Scotland's disabled voters casting their vote or being able to vote in secret can be challenging under the current system whether it's by postal vote or in the, in the, um, in the polling booths and this is where uh, an area where technology can potentially help. Electronic voting machines can have adapted modifications to make voting easier for voters with certain disabilities. For example, e-voting machines can be configured to include audio uh, and tactile interfaces for those with visual and mobility impairments. The voting instructions can be presented in different languages, including uh, visually in uh, British Sign Language. And internet voting could potentially benefit blind and visually impaired voters and people with mobility challenges also. Uh, as Ruth Maguire mentioned, another potential benefit of e-voting is in terms of whether it might help improve participation, mindful of the time. Um, we clearly aren't where we, we want to be in terms of getting participation on all, all levels. And I, I don't think anybody suggesting this would be a panacea, but I think it is right that we look to see whether this is an area which might encourage more people to vote, and particularly in the year of young people, um, those, those younger voters who, um, as I think someone said, have, have grown up in a digital world. Um, so, so that is certainly something that we need, need to look to. Clearly, there are challenges which... You don't need to rush, Minister, so I'm giving you extra time Thank for the intervention. You. Clearly, there are challenges... So you'll be able to hear me now. Clearly, there are challenges um, as well, which many members have raised, and, and I, I can confirm the government is, is listening very carefully to all, all the challenges brought forward. Um, we need to... There, there are clear concerns around security, um, which has been raised by a number of members, the integrity of the votes cast in any electronic system. Um, any change introduced here in Scotland um, would have to win the confidence of the voter, a point I think made um, quite clearly by, by Patrick Harvey. Um, today's motion makes reference to the Scottish Government's public consultation on electoral reform. A consultation gives us the opportunity to explore a wide range of alternatives to the existing electoral processes and we are keen to hear people's views not just on this particular innovation but on a whole range of other changes um, that we are asking um, for people's views on. Um, Patrick Harvey mentioned the, the weather that interfered with his uh, 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 meeting last week and on the basis of that we've been trying to meet with a number of stakeholders in order to, to hear um, views on, on the, the consultation but because of the weather that I think has, has posed some challenges for some of those um, those, those groups. Um, on that basis, um, 
um, announcing today that we intend to extend the consultation to the 29th of March. Um, I'm hoping that tonight's debate will help encourage more people, whatever their views are, to, to feed in, and I hope that, that extra time will make that, that easier for that to happen. Inclusion, in conclusion, again, thank Mr Stevenson for bringing this debate to the Chamber and for members for their considered contributions. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.